morning. I know we meet on the stolen lands of the Gimoy, Walbara, Yudinji people. I first moved to Gimoy, Cairns in the early 90s to study at JCU. Before too long, I was appointed president of the James Cook University Student Association, organising O-Week celebrations in the UN Year of Indigenous Peoples. I had no idea then, but looking back now, many years later, I realised how formative this experience was in shaping my relationship to this place. Not just here, but this entire place now known as Australia. My respect to elders past and present and to all First Nations people present here today. I'm so very fortunate to share this place with you and every day grateful that I do. From my heart, thank you. Thanks also to the social science community um, for the Great Barrier Reef, for the invitation, Grabumpa, the Cancer Institute, of course, thank you very much for this invitation and thank you to all of you for being here. So this is what we are doing today. Often when I say I'm a communication scholar, it is assumed that I'm good at writing a snappy headline. Thank you. Um, I trust that with the title of my presentation today, I've put that myth to rest. It is such a privilege to be speaking with you this morning and I've not taken the privilege, privilege lightly. As other humans here today might understand, I've grappled with what I'd like to say and how to say it. I've asked colleagues what they thought constitutes a good keynote. One colleague and a friend quipped, one that's not boring, which reminded me of that time that I um, fangirled one of my favorite public intellectuals. This guy wrote like a knife, sharp, consequential, and, I, and was everything social and, and environmental justice that is me too. So you can imagine my anticipation. He has one hour to speak and begins by saying, I have 10 points. I'm like, right, here we go. This is going to be great. We're 40 minutes in and he's at number two. <laughs> the audience has had pre-note, thanks. The audience has had pre-keynote drinks, some older journo lush types and they are dropping like flies around the room. Their heads drop back, you know, their mouths wide open, arms folded, snoozing. And with a colleague, I was laughing so hard. You know, that laugh that you're not allowed to laugh, that you're not supposed to be laughing. So my goal here today is to look around the room at the end and see people awake, except that I have the coffee advantage this morning. So today I'm going to do three things, not 10. One will be part personal reflection on me and my Great Barrier Reef so far, part gentle academic provocation, drawing on my own communication scholarship, and part call to action to reflect on the status quo in reef research and how might we continue to push the boundaries and expand the parameters for humanities, arts, and social sciences research that you who sit here before me today have already begun. Little Kerry. Fortunately for you and vis-a-vis -vis my early anecdote, I'm not going to tell you my life story, but I will take a moment to situate myself and my work and to humanize this. I grew up in Queensland, north side of Brisbane, near a coast that looks nothing like the one outside today, but has its own beauty. Working class kid, got lucky and found myself in Cairns around 1985 on my way over to Green Island. I remember clear as emerging from the plane and breathing in that lush, the heavy air and the light that all hangs here, drapes here. And I instantly thought home. I remember clear too, putting my head under the water for the first time as I did yesterday, the color, the life, the fish. 
I've always loved the coast, beaches, water and the ocean, partly, I guess, for its freedom from the suburbs. But this Great Barrier Reef, epic. As a life goal, I finally returned in the early 90s to study at the then, the then JCU campus here in Cairns. Things got a little messy and complicated. As a now sole parent, my enthusiasm for study took a turn. It was time to get my house literally in order. And so I did. I moved to Warrnambool in Southwest Victoria, quite the culture shock, and began an arts degree with a major in what was then called communication and cultural studies. There is one single idea that I encountered in the early days of my communication studies that blew my mind then and has sustained my entire career for the last 30 years. You know that idea that makes the ground shift beneath your feet? You feel a little bit unsteady and it shifts and alters and changes how you think. For me, that simple idea was the relationship between culture and nature, or more specifically, the communicative relationship between culture and nature. Who knew? Who knew that each, that each time I entered the ocean, I brought with me a certain framework for interpreting my experience, and before this, seeking the experience was an expression of my immersion in Australian coastal culture. Who knew? there were cultures of natures. I can remember the example my lecturer gave to illustrate the point. We studied a milk carton with black and white cows raising on green hills, so natural. And then we discussed the processes that led to the creation of said milk carton, not so natural. And so critical discussions about the way relations in, of culture and nature were communicated and represented on that milk carton, what was being amplified and what was being hidden. Milk cartons aside, but not cows, strangely enough, I'll get to that in a moment, this is the foundation of the disciplinary lens that I bring to the GBR. The relationship between communication, culture and nature is absolute. The idea that we encounter nature using existing cultural frameworks is the fundamental idea here. And I adopt an anthropological definition of culture as a whole way of life, characteristic of certain people or groups of people. To engage with culture using this definition is to elevate specific ways of seeing that express the shared ideas, beliefs, and significantly practices of individuals, groups, and communities. Paul and Jefferson define culture as the peculiar and distinctive way of life, the meanings, values, and ideas embodied in institutions, in social relations, in systems of belief, in mores and customs, in uses of objects and material life. A culture includes the maps of meaning, which make things intelligible to its members. Thus, culture is thought or the maps of meaning that make phenomena, phenomena intelligent, intelligible and meaningful. Significantly, culture mutually guides our actions through which we produce tangible expressions of intangible thoughts and meanings. How we communicate the reef is an expression of the relations between culture and nature. Just got a dose of that with, with auntie. Communication is not just in our heads, it becomes things. It defines and guides practice and action. As John Dewey explains so eloquently here, society not only continues to exist by transmission, by communication, but it may be fairly said to exist in transmission, in communication. There is more than a verbal tie between the words common community and communication. Men, sick, <laughs> live in a community in virtue of the things they have in common and communication is the way in which they come to possess things in common. The ways in which we communicate about the reef cause it to exist. Not literally, of course, that would be, you know, peak anthropocentric. <laughs> But in communicating the reef, we set boundaries for what is legitimate, a 
authoritative and expert. How do we, and later, how could we communicate the relationship between ourselves and the reef in ways that will deliver transformation so urgent to ensure its, and more accurately, our own survival? Unexpected cow PowerPoint. So not expecting this, but it's not a cow. Okay, well, whatever, you know, but the more substantive point remains. Deb? Um, so I'm going to land some of these ideas about communication, culture, and nature with my cow. Or well, whatever. Um, so here we have a cow. In other contexts at this moment, I'd ask for some audience participation, but can't do that today because that would be far too hectic. Uh, I'd invite participants to stand here with me and then give them a persona. One might be a farmer, another a vet, a butcher, Hindu, vegan, barbecue, eater, and whatever is the gender opposite of that animal. And I'd ask each one to look at the car, cow and ask what they see. And in responding, they communicate the cultural frameworks that they bring to phenomena and phenomenon to explain it, to make sense of the cow and their relationship to it. In their responses, they illuminate their cow truth. Stay with me. There is no right cow here. There are only different ways of seeing the cow and different places people see the cow differently. Each person brings cultural, different cultural frameworks to this nature. And when they communicate about it, this relationship is evident and enters the realms of public discussion and debate where ideas, power and resources jostle and collide for position and prominence. Of course, each participant sees their understanding of the cow as the most important and most right. And that's the easy bit to explain. But to highlight power relations, legitimacy, expertise and authority we can ask which version of the cow is at the fore of public discussion and debate? Which versions of the cow would be invited to government, industry and official meetings, international gatherings, to conferences, to all the pre professional networks where opportunities arise? And which versions of the cow would be reported by mainstream news media organisations to broadcast to their large audiences as a way of affirming that this is the most important cow. Hegemony and the common sense of the cow. Because we are doing more than just communicating about the cow. We are communicating networks and relations of power, knowledge, legit legitimacy and authority. We signal what is dominant and marginal in understanding the cow and in doing so, open conversations about democracy, participation, justice, of equity and diversity, of nurturing innovation and maintaining the status quo, of inclusion and exclusion and all the intersections and complexities of these binaries. Cue beautiful reef picture. My gentle prov provocation today and this is what drives my work and my critical kindred in the environmental humanities, arts and social sciences. What if we replace the cow with the Great Barrier Reef? At this moment, what is the common sense of communicating the Great Barrier Reef? And therefore the areas of power, legitimacy, expertise, and where funding accrue. Who or what is included and what is excluded and remains on the margins? And with what consequences for us here today, for the reef, its future, and for our capacity to respond to and better mitigate the crisis that threaten our very existence and that of the fishes, the corals and catchments that we love and work to protect and conserve every day. And then for those of us doing well in the reef space, to what extent do we benefit or not from the reef status quo? the common sense of how we communicate and therefore create the Great Barrier Reef. Is the entry of the Great Barrier Reef social sciences circumscribed by their alignment with the reef status quo or the common sense of how we communicate the reef and its priorities? That is, 
that the reef is mostly understood and therefore researched and managed in ways that prioritise science and industry. These methods, these values, these cultural framework, frameworks that give power, legitimacy and indeed funding to types of social sciences and not to others. What is the communication catchment for the Great Barrier Reef and its research? If by now you've identified the cultural frameworks of the butcher, farmer and vet would be the dominant ways we communicate the cow, you may have already started to justify in your own mind why this is the case. Similarly, we can, at a broad brushstroke, identify the dom dominant ways in which the GBR is communicated and those that remain marginal and why this is so and begin to make this common sense strange. It is a common sense, it is common sense that the reef is communicated as a scientific object and that the threats to the reef's ecologies would be defined by scientists and scientific organisations. Nor is it surprising that public debate and discussion about the reef would prioritise economy and in particular key industries of tourism, farming, agriculture, fishing and mining. The reef is, after all, communicated in the context of a dominant Western culture where late industrialised capitalism, neoliberalism and science are bedfellows and common sense, albeit at times uncomfortably so. There is much more to unpack in these observations than I have time to do here, though this is partly my point, that unpacking the human and social dimensions of the reef is difficult and complex science. With this caveat and my genuine invitation for your own critical reflections, I'll make some observations about the consequences of communicating our relationship with the reef in ways that prioritise science and industry. Here's one. When Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull dropped $444 million into the Great Barrier Reef Foundation in 2018, funding went to improving water quality, uh, research into coral resilience and adaptation, research into COTS, community engagement, especially citizen science programs, engagement with TOs and custodians, and management and monitoring of the reef. All very important. Critical work at the current juncture and all directly re related to and supportive of reef science. No worries. Totally supportive, right? However, $444 million and not a dime for Rowan Lloyd or other environmental history projects related to the GBR. Of course, I called the foundation too, but nothing there for me either. Nothing for the Friends of Ninny Rise to continue their ongoing heritage restoration of the place where so much reef history and significant lies down the road here at Bingle Bay. Not a dime for projects led by artists, musics, musicians, novelists, sociologists, for political scientists, only when their work aligned with the parameters of existing reef common sense. I was told citizen science, water quality, TO engagement, 444 million. My point here is not to uh, criticize the GBRF, though the process leading to this funding is surely worthy of some. Rather, it is to note that resources and power accrue to those projects that align with science, industry, and the dominant ways that we have established the common sense of the reef and that this includes some cultures of natures and excludes others. I'd venture that these boundaries of legitimate reef work and research have been set and reset and reorganized like chess pieces on the same chess table at every significant moment in the reef's modern history. history. Primarily and somewhat controversially because they take place in the context of Western industrialized culture where science, industry and economy and the relationships between nature and culture therein dominate. And this has led us here. To be clear, I'm not saying this is wrong. This is simply to say that how we communicate the reef and how we come to understand and know the reef is embedded in relations of power and knowledge. And we do well to reflect at this, at this critical juncture on both consequences and importantly, opportunities to alter the current trajectory for our own and the reef's future. Speaking of reef futures, you might imagine my excitement when I read the recently released Reef Futures Roundtable report. In the foreword from the Australian Academy of Science Director, Professor Chenapati Jagadish, sorry I butchered that, and, and he writes, 
As the Academy approached the task of planning this project, it became immediately obvious that there, were, there was no separating nature and culture when it comes to the GBR. And my heart skips a beat, I go, oh, man, oh, man. Land and sea cannot be separated, he writes. No priority can be selected on an ecological basis alone. Having a traditional knowledge as co-chair in each round table allowed for different sources of knowledge, different sources of knowledge to be shared and to form a basis for the number of observations featured in this report. What is happening here? It seems as though, and with due respect for the distinctiveness, the only group that bring culture to the reef are traditional owners. This is not my story to tell in most ways, but thinking that culture beyond TOs does not impact the types of knowledge that circulate in this reef features report. I don't think so. It's the privilege of the unconsciousness. Don't have to think we have a culture or I have a culture. Participation in the three round tables evidence what is permissible, legitimate, and indeed the future of reef interventions in an era marked by climate and other ecological crises. And in the conclusion, they write, the GBR is a global icon and part of the Australian people's identity. In recent decades, scientists, locals, and TOs have been witnessing the decline of the GBR's condition, health, and function. Truthful, open, and clear communication with the public is needed to prepare Australians for what is to come, given the GBR will continue to change as the environment becomes uh, more challenging for its habitats and species. Clear communication is also important to garner support for necessary management interventions to protect the GBR to the greatest extent possible. It begs the question at this point in my presentation, communicate what exactly? I'd say more of the same repeated cultural frameworks for communicating the reef. Though unintended, the Reef Futures Report clearly answers the question, what is the culture of this nature? And here we are with a noble but desperate attempt, a desperate and frustrated attempt to bypass the complexity of the political, social and cultural dimensions of the GBR. Currently, there is significantly more funding for sea cucumbers than there is to delve deep into the complexity of the human, the social, the cultural, the political, the historical, the creative that can help to explain why this ad did not work and create better ones. And actually more than this, the obscene amount of money spent on the reef, as one very senior reef scientist put it to me, and yet here we are, churning the same priorities, the same relations to the reef, the daily communication of, which, of as much to publics who, somewhat predictably from my standpoint, are not roused in numbers sufficient to arrest our current trajectory to e towards ecological collapse. Ex explanations for why this is so and what could be done will not be found in, with due respect, more transects and fish counts, as important as these are. The humanities, arts and social sciences can prompt critical reflections about gaps and silences, about power, diversity, equity and justices in how we could better figure our relationships with, re with the reef towards more positive futures, about alternatives and innovations, no, interventions that disrupt established thinking and inspire and empower alternatives, inciting and enchanting com communities and their cultures. The humanities, arts and social sciences potential to contribute to saving the reef is limited such that it is akin to sending our STEM colleagues out to the GBR, but only funding, only legitimizing the biologists and the geomorphologists. I mean, talk about bleached. The good news is what is here before me today, all of you who bring the social sciences to the reef, but I know, and I've spoken to many of you, so, and so do you, that we can do better. Research and projects capable of fostering enduring change should challenge the common sense that is faltering, faltering and failing humani humanity and environments under late industrial capitalism. As social scientists, we need the critical self-reflexivity -re to check our own complicity with Western cultural norms 
and its system of in industrial capitalist relations that are killing ourselves and our planet and our reef. If we are committed to advocating and fostering possible positive environmental futures, then our position in relation to the damaging and dominant relentless cultures of nature that would harm us must be one of ongoing critique and alternatives. This critique and alternatives is and has always been the stuff of the humanities, arts and social sciences. In an article from a recent special issue of Queensland Review, Killian Quigley reflects on colour in the reef, asking the reader to reckon the loss of hue as a discrete catastrophe that might therefore generate fragile but hopeful tool, tools. He writes, caring for the reef may be not first of all, not first of all, but not least of all, caring for colour, a caring against chromatic disappearance and a caring towards chromatic repair. Perhaps then the first way to begin to restore the colours of the reef is to better leverage and engage all the colours, all the hues of the humanities, arts and social sciences and invite them to communicate their reef and fund it as a part of the formal, legitimate and powerful initiatives of reef research and management. I'm not exactly sure what this looks like, but I am sure that we are steadily running out of other options apart from a fundamental reorientation in the way in which humanity understands, defines, and ultimately enacts, enacts its relationship with nature. And I am sure that this is one intervention that we haven't tried yet. I'll end here with this quote from Linda Hogan, Chickasaw poet and novelist, and this idea, here is a lesson, what happens to people and what happens to the land and the reef is the same thing. I've heard this repeatedly in our own First Nations culture. I invite you to spend the next few days uh, reflecting on the relationship between the reef and the people and how we might expand that for a more positive future for the reef and ourselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm.